know God breed on this. I know God breed on this. Brand for upcoming creators, the Facebook for creators, a community of creatives. That's what collective is to me. It's kind of giving creatives a voice. Welcome home family. My name is Kelsey Davis, founder and CEO of Collective and host of Every Human, where we help creators create the life they want. And the creator that we're talking to today is Franchel Abdallah. She is a creator, a builder, a real estate developer, someone who can literally go from zero to 100 when it comes to creating real estate development projects. Um, so today we're gonna hear all about her story, her journey, um, why she goes about the process of building the way that she does. And I'm super excited to also hear how she takes community and integrates community into all of that. So let's sit down and talk to Franchelle Abdallah. Let's get into it. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome home to every human, where every human is a creator. Uh, I'm here today with um, one of my favorite creators, one of my favorite creators holistically, uh, Franchelle Abdallah. Hello. Hello. How are you? I am blessed, highly favored. Come on, preach it. A little cold. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, but humbled to be here with you. Um, I remember the first time that we were introduced um, outside of uh, OSU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not too yeah. long ago. Uh, and um, I remember the introduction... And I was like, yo, this is this is this is this is someone that's one of them ones. You you gotta know her, right? Like this is all right. And then we met and I remember I felt your energy. I remember um being with Elle. I remember I remember feeling the energy and I'm like, hmm, like, who is that? I'm just kinda like, huh. Who didn't like, step up in the room? Yeah, like who who is that? <laughs> um So who is French Wow. Um, interesting question. I would say definitely um a lover of people, um, authentic, creative, a mother, an entrepreneur, um, I would say, but ultimately like a person who is very clear about purpose mm. and why I'm here. Haven't always known that to be true about myself, but uh, that's mm. exactly who I am. Mm. Would you identify who you are today with who you've been maybe historically or who you grew up being? No, I would say I knew that at a very young age, I was really purposed to do something cool and great. Um, but, you know, life teaches you that that's a lie. And so you start to listen to mm. a lie and you start to listen to other people's thoughts mm. and ideas and, and, and concepts around who they think you are. And you believe that and you internalize that. And so there was a period I would probably say from the time I was a teenager to... I mean, even to like five years ago where I wasn't clear um, because it was so clouded with other people's thoughts. But, you know, I was blessed to have some time where right before I came to Tulsa, I got quiet and still mm. and I could remember the voice of that person who I was created to be. And so mm. hearing that voice again, getting comfortable and familiar with it yeah. um, allowed, you know, allowed her to reemerge. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are familiar uh comfortable if they doing the right thing uh with you in this city uh you're a builder uh you are a developer yes uh you are a community builder you are a economy builder uh you're a curator um talk to me about how you got into the profession that you're in and how would you define that profession? Um, so many people are going to define it as I'm a real estate developer. I think, but to your point, I'm a builder. Um, and that started a long time ago. It started being that kid, like on Saturday mornings, that would go to my, you know, the Goodwill with my mother. Mm -hmm. And she would pick up like architectural digest books and put it on our coffee table, <laughs> even though the editions were out. <laughs> <laughs> out of date yeah. um, and she would take us on Sundays and go look at properties and be like you know one day you could do this or you could mm. build this um, and I'd be like oh, mama you know we ain't got no money for and all you that. were in Omaha at the I was time? in Omaha at yeah. the time and, um, and break down Omaha you've broken down to me before which is interesting I was completely unfamiliar mm -hmm. 
Um, what what's kind of the landscape of Omaha? What was it like when you were growing up, and what's kind of that historical landscape that set up the context for us to understand who you were at the time? Yeah, Omaha is an old city. It dates back to about 1869 is when the city was established, and it's a beautiful city. It's very similar to Tulsa in, in a lot of ways, and in other ways, it's very, very, very different. Um, I grew up as a military kid, so when my parents got married, uh, my father had us moving all over the country. So lived in Colorado, lived in uh, New Mexico, spent a lot of time in Bellevue, went to Okinawa and then came back. And so Mm. I was blessed to kind of have two childhoods, one when my mother was a single parent kind of raising us. And then once my mother got remarried, then having this large extended family where we were also able to travel. So kind of had those two identities. But Omaha, I mean, I would run downtown all the time because my mother worked downtown on these like cobble brick streets. And it was... um, part of the oldest part of the city it's called the old market it's a historic component and so I knew like once I had children I was moving back to Omaha Mm. as an adult I was going to live in the city core because my parents had moved and retired and lived in the suburbs and I knew that wasn't my life Mm but um, moved back to what was a historic African-American community where my grandparents had um, resettled from Tyler Texas they had owned a number of businesses when they resettled in Omaha and so I got close with cousins and uncles and aunties and uh, really rooted myself in in North Omaha, again black neighborhood, right in the arts and culture district, um, and and started to work. It's so interesting because when you talk about that um, community, it reminds me of like how I grew up in Atlanta, um, not where I was raised per se, but where I more so put myself, um, you know, geographically in the city where. You're literally in the crux of community, culture, art. You see what happens when people collaborate. You see what happens when people invest in the philosophers and the respected creators in those mm-hmm. localized regions. Um, you see what happens when this, uh, the cities and the, the governments and the businesses work with the current of the market uh, and with the community and times when they work against. Like, um, And as a kid... Um, at least for me, I was always just, uh, everything is always kind of like stimulus. You don't know particularly Mm -hmm. like what it is yet as much as like, oh wow, this is exciting or this is new or, um, and for me, Atlanta was an area where there was a lot of that and I was able to really explore and roam and, and range, um, and get my hands dirty in a lot of, a lot of different things. But no matter where I was, I was protected in a way, right? Because it's, you were with um, community, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And that can mean people that look like you racially, but also just like culturally, right? Like we're invested in the same vision, values, uh, mission, right? Like we believe in the same maybe future of the city, Mm -hmm. right? And so the way in which we galvanize around activity, events, um, you know, you could see where is the culture, what is the Mm -hmm. culture, when is culture being created. Um, And so, yeah, I think it's really cool you grew up in a a space like that. So so you're saying that, um, you know, mixed with your mom's interest around, you know, architecture, Mm -hmm. space, building, it's like for you, it's was your mindset kind of like, if I could build a city, I would, or if I could build a, okay. So how, so how, so how did we get there? Uh, You know, really, honestly, um, I would say what was probably formative is that my grandparents were like accidental leaders. Um, They had a gas station. They owned a Rextraw drugstore, which is like uncommon for black people to own a drugstore. And in the back was a mechanic shop. And so my grandfather let his buddies run a jitney stand out of it. And so they were kind of like these gatekeepers. People came to my grandparents for everything they were the only black people on their block at the time when they moved to Omaha and by the time like the 60s happened it was an all black block do you think it was because they were able to occupy space like what was it that do you think created Uh, that centralized uh one my grandfather was cool uh (laughs) who I'm named after so he went to the Korean War right and so he always wore this like beret when he came out the military and people are like oh that's French Lamont because he Mm. (laughs) and so French L so my mother was big into language and just took the feminine and called me French L uh but he was I mean 
By all accounts, he was this kind of like community leader. People looked to him for advice and information. My grandmother was a stay-at-home woman, but she also ran the drugstore. And so mm. white folks would come in and say, because I remember being a little kid sitting um, behind the glass shelf, and she would say, hey, how can I help you? And people would think that she was working there, and she actually owned it. And so that taught me very early on, like you can build community in and out of everything, right? Because mm. it's really about us. It's not about the things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can also create create an entire economy that's invisible to the to the naked eye yeah. uh, but that moves black people forward and so my grandparents raised seven kids so I would say that's where really building started uh, because my grandfather made sure that all of his children were protected. Mm. Um, they lived in a home that they built. They built the upstairs while they were living in the basement. And so we grew up with these stories of building. And then they owned land in Tyler. Or they owned land in Big Sandy um, where they were from. And so I heard that very early on. Uh, and then I had parents who were like, you know, my, my father, who is my stepfather, grew up in South Oak Cliff. He never lived yeah. in a home until... I was in the eighth grade because that entire time he had been in military housing um, or when he and my mother got married, uh, they were in rental houses. And so I watched a grown man actually build his home from the ground up. And I was a kid. So I saw that, like, how did the footings get laid in? How do you select the interior? How do you move stuff behind the steps? And so I think all of that is kind of like the alchemy of what makes me a builder. It was that experience. It was the exposure. And then I'm just a natural curious kid. I loved building. I loved tinkering. I loved yeah. figuring out how things worked. Yeah. Um, Tell me some of the things that you've been tinkering with recently and building recently. What are some of the <laughs> exciting projects uh, that you're, you've been working on? Um, I would say some of the exciting things have been FinTube, right? What is Evans uh, FinTube? Evans FinTube is 11 acres in historic Greenwood um, that really was untouched by the 1921 race massacre, although it was a witness to the atrocity that was the massacre. Uh, It was built originally in 1906, and it was the old Bethlehem Steel and Supply Building. And so much of the steel and ironwork that you see in the Tulsa skyline was built right there. That still came from that plant. Uh, But what was interesting is that it was always segregated from black folks. And so um, while the massacre happened just on the other side of the railroad tracks, the building actually stood. And so what I love Love about this project is it's it's an opportunity to reclaim space for us, right? What was really st- invisible to most people of no real impact was really a visible force in in creating Tulsa. And so we wanted to recreate a new opportunity for black folks and reclaim space that had been withheld from us. And so um, excited about that project. It's a commercial mixed use project. Uh, We'll transform the building. We'll build a beacon, not just uh, for Tulsans to look up in the sky and see that it's for them, but really something that's a rallying cry globally. She means a literal beacon. Yeah, like a beacon, it's, it's going to be a, you know. <laughs> that wasn't like a metaphor. No, it's a 42-story tower. 42-story tower 42 story tower is what she meant to say. Yeah, that's facing. That looks up north, north yeah, to it, North Tulsa. Yeah, we positioned it because we Right next we to the, uh, the, the BMX yes. building uh, uh, right off Archer downtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That building. 11 so, acres. So we're very excited Look about it. Look at his face. I wish you could see you're like, yeah. it's gonna be um, yeah. but it's going to be, I mean, it, it'll be so beautiful, you know, because, you know, I think about the time I was a kid, you know, I was in downtown looking at tall buildings thinking like, man, that's amazing. And what you see um, out of your window or what you see in front of you really dictates what you believe is possible for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I wanted black kids to say, huh, that's on my side of town. You know, downtown is great. It's wonderful. It, it has its historic buildings. It's art deco. It's wonderful. But, but to take an industrial building that really had no value has been vacant for 20 years. Um, and to be able to create something that faces North Tulsa, it doesn't face the South, right? Cause we don't defer our power. We turn ourselves towards what is, What is not just inspirational, but what is the possibility of us? Mm. So we faced it north um, intentionally that way. Something that's tall and beautiful. uh, Things that, you know, black kids can look out of their, you know, their window on 36th Street or on Apache and say, yep, somebody who looked like me built that. Yep. I cannot wait to see that out of my window. Uh, Why is occupying space important for you? I know we have a lot of conversations. We talk about development often. And um, anytime we're talking about any type of deal... The thing that seems like is yearning from your heart at the table seems like, no, we need to occupy this space now. 
Mm-hmm. And yes, obviously we need the plans. Yes, you know, yada, yada, yada. But we are racing against something that is so much bigger and invisible that we know. Mm-hmm. And you're often the advocate to bring people together in alignment um, with a sense of urgency what, around what seems to be the main goal of occupying space in particular location mm-hmm. of North Tulsa, Greenwood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why is that important? Occupying space is important because land is the only thing that's a limited quality, you know, quantity in this world, right? We're not making any more land, right? And so you know that every seed has a container in which it grows. And for us, that's land, right? And so if we are Mm. going to be the types of creators, builders, um, creatives that we're meant to be, we need a container for that to happen in. And so my job on this earth is to gobble up as many containers as I possibly can so that the soil is ripe to be able to plant in it the types of folks necessary that will change this world. Yeah. And so whether that's a building, whether that's a lot, whether that's a whole subdivision I'm going to create, occupying space is important because it's necessary for you to be who you are. Yeah, I agree. And that's something that we talk about often. Um, I mean, we're in conversations, you know, with everyone from, you know, the venture capitalist to the artists, to the philanthropists, to the engineers, the architects. Um, and everyone has the need uh, from kind of someone else on the other side, if you will. So it's like your your thing is like, hey, you know, uh, land is the thing that is the commodity that, you know, is not this resource that is just expendable right Mm -hmm. is it is a limited commodity that we have to go get um and so you're kind of fighting the powers that be if you will um anywhere in order to occupy space um my thing on a day-to-day is i'm working with creators to help them create and it's like hey you know uh, they often have limited resources, right? Whether that's time, money, mm-hmm. et cetera. Um, and I'm kind of like, hey, here's how you can, you know, create. But at some point, I've noticed it is literally impossible to function without space, right? So Absolutely. it's like for the creator, it's like, look, you can get the checks, you can get the money, right? You can have the relationships with people, right? Uh, you can get the technology, Mm -hmm. Um, literally from an equipment standpoint. There are times where it's like, yo, we got, you know, over $100,000 on the table to to do some stuff, but shit, where are we going to do it? We do not literally have the physical space locally, at least in a lot of contexts, um, to do things like, yo, we got to, we, we, I got to, you know, get dinner with seven people tonight, for example, right? All black people. And we got some really important things that we about to talk about. I can't particularly point to a restaurant mm-hmm. that all seven individuals would feel comfortable even maybe being seen together, mm-hmm. gathered, uh, space to talk, you to know politic, that I'm going like to be served with respect, right? Right. Um, that I can have fun, that I'm not going to have to worry about, like that cripples our ability to function Mm -hmm. as human beings. Yeah. And I think it's important to occupy space because it's the very first tactic that people do uh, in terms of colonization. Mm. They don't colonize your mind until they colonize your land. Right. Um, Being in your space allows me to Mm. influence your airspace in a way that you start to think that really I'm your center. Mm. When I own space or when I can get (laughs) investment groups that can come together that are black and say, you know, what, we can buy this. We can own this. We shift the center back to ourselves instead of having to occupy and and, and placate to their center. And they know where the center often exist regardless i think yeah, often we are the, the, the the we're able to kind of manufacture whether a geographical landscape an economic landscape an agricultural landscape uh, insert industry um where we can almost like create a fictionalized universe and utopia mm-hmm. that then will place people into rather than maybe invest where they are give them the independent ability to think for themselves Mm -hmm. um, and assume that that's then going to create natural bottom up order, which then I would argue actually creates real communal community development, economic development, Mm -hmm. you know, alignment interests, maybe rather than at at top down, there's always going to be friction. Absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, like 
Like, this shit is basic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, when you go to a nice space, how do you feel? When you go yeah. to a space that's free. Almost like you got to elevate, like you got to, you know, elevate you can, to it. You can live in a yeah. way that your spirit, you can hear your own spirit, right? And so being able to facilitate that for many people is important to me. Yeah. Um, because so often we go into spaces that are hostile to us, the spirit of us, right? Mm. It's nice to us on, on its face. Uh, but when we get there, we recognize that we don't feel comfortable. We know something is off, but we can't see it in the yeah. atmosphere. And so for me, it's like, no, I want to create spaces where we can just be, yeah. like mentally be safe, yeah. emotionally be safe spiritually be safe yeah. uh, and economically be safe right yeah. uh because part of the the spaces that they curate for us they also monetize and and they maximize what they monetize from yeah. us and my thing is i'd rather build a space for us to be able to capture yeah. our own wealth yeah talk to me about what is the creative process if you will right of development right development mm. is, is your art form we can use evans fin tube as an example um i know that's a very interesting complex um model i guess to use but but maybe that is the right one right because it is so partners process right very bottom up in terms of vision articulation mm -hmm. um take us from you know beginning to now um of your development process um specifically using evans fin tube as an example sure i would say it's very unorthodox uh <laughs> because i was a community organizer first right mm. like i came out of graduate school and i was like oh i'm gonna go and i'm gonna be an ambassador had a baby and was like okay no i better make some money so we can feed her yeah. um and so i became a community organizer at the housing authority um and at the mm. same time i got an opportunity to learn so much around just bottom up like community building but also so like, what is real struggle look like? And if you could create a world for yourself, um, absent of what are some of the circumstances you've been placed in, what would that look like? And so that really is my community. Like that's my development process. I know it's not standard. Like I'm an engineer architect. Mm -hmm. um, I get to the heart of it. What's the spirit of the space? What is in the soil here? What are the opportunities? And then I can start to see almost like people paint like, oh, okay, that's supposed to be a three-story building. Oh, okay, that's supposed to be retail. Oh, that's supposed to be an incubator. That's supposed to be a grocery store. Like that's how I kind of start. It's walking the space. It's getting a sense of what's around it. And then it's listening to people about what do they see as either missing in their community? What do they need? Or really like, what's the gap, right? Like when you look at your finger, most people pay attention to their fingers. I pay attention to the spaces mm. in between, right? Like my community is missing this. It's missing that. It's missing this. And if I can just get those things into the environment, I can build a well-rounded holistic community or I can at least lend my hand to it. And so that's my process. And then it starts to galvanize, right? Like what do the numbers look like? If it were this thing, like building out the budget, building out the expenses, figuring out like are there other development concepts that have gone in other places that are successful? Can we glean from those? Um, it's really taking all of those pieces yeah. um, and, and, and weaving a story. Yeah. And for you, how much is, um, when you think about creativity, right, uh, you know, some could argue, you know, development, right, like, uh, or real estate, or, you know, I don't know, construction, or contracting work, like, I don't know if that's creative, right? Oh, uh, there's an art to this shit. Yeah. <laughs> no. How do you, yeah, what is the art to development? Um, I think it's, I think the art is, um, is definitely the tangible, right? It's faith, belief in what you don't see and having the possibility to bring that into the visible seam realm. Mm. I think it's 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 listening, right? Being sensitive to community and what community needs are, understanding how the dollar works and how control of that dollar has a direct impact on the people that you want to serve. Um, and then it has everything to do with this this uh, ability to you know, galvanize people, convene people in a way that they can buy in. So, so yeah. I bring on an architect who, who yeah. can hear what I'm saying and draw that. Yeah. Um, an engineer who understands that in order to build that, we got to be able to get to this in the dirt. Um, you know, a planner who understands how does this flow in terms of the overall landscape of this particular site in the city. And so it's taking these people in their respective places and, and putting them on a team so that harmoniously we can develop the vision yeah and do you do you develop that vision for uh the people that are there in a neighboring proximity let's say for example of this land 
right when you when you do projects or do you develop it for the people that you assume are going to come both talk to me about that both um because and does everybody care about it who's involved to the same degree it's mandatory so like when we started fintube um you know it's crazy right because what developer on their first major um, project out the gate is going to go after something that's a quarter of a billion dollars. And so you got to be a little crazy to ride with me because you have to be able to see it, hear it, know it, and believe that it's true for yourself and that you operate in your gifting out of that. So for everyone that was on the team, I asked them two things. Do you believe in the vision and can you support it? And secondly, are you just as much at risk as I am, right? Mm. Because part of it is um, this is a gamble. We don't know, right? Mm -hmm. It's a complete faith walk. We don't know what's going to happen, and we don't know if we're going to win. But you got to be able to publicly stand by what's presented. Mm. And you've got to be able Woo! to be at risk. And not everybody is willing to be exposed. And so, How is that, how is that process for you, especially as a visionary, as a creator, right? Like I envision like for me, even as a director, um, historically, it's like at a, at a way smaller scale, right? It's like, okay, you, you know, maybe, you know, you're working with this writer who's going to present the script and then, you know, that then needs to get greenlit and then you come and you, you develop that and then you bring in the, the, the cast, the crew um, to then bring that to life. And then you have to have a director whom the cast trust and who could, who the writer um, gives maybe a little rope and who uh, the producers are like, Hey, like this is why we brought them here. Right. And mm -hmm. there's this almost kind of collaborative trust relationship that happens has to happen where you bring the visionary in to be the visionary and and with a trust that uh they are a leader whom we want to follow right but the director in in my context uh developer you in this context um you have to be willing to stand by the thing before we release it to the public, knowing that this is the thing regardless like like whether we get chosen as the team rather this uh, in your context, in this context, whether this hits a blockbuster, whether this gets, you know, no retention and engagement mm -hmm. in the market, um, you know that you are going to be associated with this thing independent of how the market receives it. Right. How was that uh, energy wise, relationally? You're working with people locally, um, some more national who came on board. Like, what was that like for you as a visionary? who's maybe sensitive about your shit, uh, you know, bringing that to, to people and kind of saying, listen, this is what it is. You could like, this is, this is a time where the train comes around and you could be on or not. And mm -hmm. what was that like? I knew, I knew like when I said yes to this thing, um, I knew it was the right thing to do. I knew that the vision we put forward was one that emanated from community. It's like, we're not that smart, but we definitely listened. And so we put forward what was aspirational that was already birthed here. Like it was, it was, you know, it's funny. People are like, how did you come up with it? And I'm like, really like the shit was basic. It was looking at the blueprint that was already here and saying, okay, we can pull from that. We can pull from that. Uh, we could do this. Okay, let's put it and package it together. But one thing that I was very clear about is that I was supposed to do it. Now, mm. come win or lose. I was supposed to do it, and so I could stand by that. Mm. And so I needed people who were on the team to have that same type of like, like, oomph, like, yeah, yeah. I know you say 42 stories is crazy. You can't build that in North Tulsa. And I wanted them to say with their chest, yes, yes, you can, and yes, we will. Um, you know, my daddy taught me something a long time ago. It's like, I don't say yes to something I think I'm going to lose. So I never had a plan B. I knew I was going to win. Uh, I won the moment I said yes to the thing. Whether they gave me the award or not is different. But I knew I had already won. And what does winning mean in this context specifically for those um, who I let black people have their day. Black people that are from here. Descendants and survivors. Um, folks who were yet to come. People who um, said that it's not possible for a black developer to develop again. As well as, you know, looking at my own children. That was success for me. To be able to articulate in a real way that people could understand that mm -hmm. not only is this going to be possible, but this will be built. This is the time to build it. And the city can say what it wants to, but I was confident that this was our time. We weren't going to get another opportunity for another hundred years. So I might as well mm. latch on to it and, and bring everyone that had ideas with us. You know, what people don't really understand is that the DNA of survivors and descendants is in our, in our project. Um, you know, there were things all of our team members saw from places they had been, but really it emanated from here. Um, and for me, the building 
was the backdrop to that. If you go to any church, like there's the um, church right down off of Greenwood Ave. Is it like Pilgrim or it has the maroon awnings? If you look at that building, they have these panoramic pictures. You see Fintube in the distance while black people's houses are burning. You see our building sitting there. That architecture was a witness to history. And so I'm like, if it could be a witness to atrocity, it could be a witness to triumph. Mm. Black people could look 100 years from now, see that building and know that they recreated a future for themselves. Yeah. And so I needed people on my team that believed that hardcore. And if you didn't, you got dropped. Yeah. How important is it for you to have community aligned around you when you create? It's everything. I need the noise, the naysayers, and the go get them. Mm. That, Tell me about that. Why? Why is it just it's it's all energy? It is. It is. It's all energy. It's all necessary, right? You can't have 100% good. You need bad. You need mm. negative. It helps to refine you. So, you know, people in the process mm. that were like, this is crazy. Or people at the city that were like, she's not going to get it built. She's not going to get it financed. Because, I mean, like, look, when, when I turned in the RFP, I had $13 in the bank. They know I'm like a mother of six <laughs> yeah. going through a divorce. They was yeah. like, this chick ain't going to get this bill. Yeah. I promise you, though, the yes triggered uh, a yes in other spaces. So mm. I started to have people come here to Tulsa say, I'll yeah. give you $10 million for the project. Yeah. I'll give you this for the project. Can I please be a part of it? So the naysayers are important because they shake the rug. Um, and in that, what floats to the top is opportunity. And so mm. um, they were just as necessary in my creative process as people who were building us up to say, you can get it, you can do it. Yeah. Um, I appreciate people who said it can't get done because at least it got awarded. Yeah. And And what do you hope people gain from your creations right I um mm. we won't say where I live but I live in front of a hopeful oh, creation wonderful. of yours uh uh you know I I literally when I drive through I mean last week I sent you a picture of uh, this space I was like hey like there's a for sale song like what could we do like it's uh because because you're the one uh for for me in my brain at least when it comes to being able to take it from seed to table right um in terms of mm -hmm. of the vision right but when I think even now as a homeowner right in North Tulsa I'm I'm and I'm young right I'm, I'm 25 I'm, I'm not married yet I don't have kids yet and when I think about the trajectory of what my hopeful next decade is um I'm like, man, like, well, shit, what is this going to look like, right? And and what what are the ways that, you know, if if I raise my family here, my kids are going to be playing in North Tulsa, ideally, right? Like, mm -hmm. as of right now, they wouldn't particularly have places to go in North Tulsa, um, you know? So what, what? how do you hope people engage with, you know, okay, you're going to come occupy all this space, right, over the next five years, um, I envision dozens of spaces. Um, what does success look like? That. That. That you're driving down Pine Street and you're like, that's my building right there. That's my land yeah. right there. That's success, right? Um, there's enough at the table for all of us to eat. I don't need it all. Don't even want it all. There are certain things I'm called to, but the rest is for everybody else. And so the fact that you would even see that there's a place at the table for you to develop that mm. is the success. You know, that's of really it. interesting because, yeah, I, I wouldn't even, even in the context of being a homeowner, like when I was living in LA literally 12 months ago, that was not a thought for me. It, it wasn't even something that I dreamt about in the immediate per se because it wasn't really, I didn't really have reference points of other 25 year olds that I go to, went to college with or that, mm -hmm. you know, were in the same spaces that I am in moving from New York, living in LA now, like, it's like, oh, like, how could I rent a better apartment? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and now it's like, I mean, I'm, o I'm over here having uh, uh, a homie, Josh Bowers, drop off his real estate <laughs> homework at my yeah. crib. Like, hey, yo, bro, like, after you do the test, just like, just slide me the information. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just trying to learn. Um, literally, just for the context of like, I know that there's the opportunity. Like, if, if I want to wake up one day and be like, you know what? We're going to try to figure out how to acquire this building across yep. the street. We're going to, hey, let's go over here and go produce this festival next yep. week. It's like we literally can. We mm -hmm. have the people 
we have the visions, we have the models, um, we have access to the funding. Um, it's often a, a conversation of like, what do we want to do? And so I'm also one of those people that are like, yo, I just want to listen, right? Like I, I say uh, all the time, like I'm just a bridge. I like to be a connector. I like to help information flow. Mm -hmm. I like to help creators create. Um, but not just for the sake of per se, as much as solving for needs yeah. and you have to be close to the streets and the community to do that. Otherwise you're going to create a caricature of what people want for the sake of the immediate market demand right. and have lots of buildings <laughs> with no occupancy Absolutely. a Soulless. decade later. Absolutely. So it's cause it's, it's not birthed out in anything real or authentic. Yeah. Um, and so you get buildings that don't really produce anything because, uh, they were really just Hollywood facades to begin with yeah. based on market demand, what we thought was hot in Austin, uh, what we think we can bring, you know, to this space. And, and, and that is not this place, right? It's gotta be right sized for the community that you live in. And, and it's right sized when it's cut back by community people. Yeah. Right? When people are like, no, nah, that don't make sense here. Or, oh, yeah. you should bring this in. Or did you know this was here and it's not here anymore like that that right sizing for the space is really important but you know like you said that's success for us it's like the fact that you would even think that you have the ability to transform the space outside your door mm. that curation of hope that is tangible um that to me is what this is about the fact that I'm a developer doesn't make any sense but it 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 makes Complete sense. Yeah. If you think about the experiences and the exposure of my life, right? But in a in a normal frame, you know, like a traditional frame, you would say she don't have the background to do this. I mean, I've had people literally tell me she's not a developer. I don't know what that means for you. That doesn't hurt me. Um, it doesn't hurt me because I shouldn't be here. <laughs> I don't know what that means for you. It doesn't hurt me. <laughs> That's a line. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's like, you know, I don't, I don't blink. Yeah. You know, you give me the ball any day. Yeah. I'm going to get it. You know, I, I'm not going to blink on things that I'm confident about. Yeah. And so I don't need their path. I have my own path. For, um, if I am a black individual living across the diaspora or if I'm a any individual that's looking for where to allocate resources, money, let's say, um, in order to activate what's going to create generational wealth for the next 100 years, um, what's going to be the cultural catalyst for what's to come. Um, I assume, think, know that what's happening in Tulsa right now has the capacity to, we literally have the capacity to build the next international culture Absolutely. hub of the world um, and the center of America. But but I know when I go home uh, on the holidays and I talk to my parents about, hey, Black Wall Street's rebuilding and da-da-da-da-da, they're like, they be looking at me like, yo, blink twice if you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yo, nah, like Tulsa, like, hey, yo, like, all right, yo, like, you from Atlanta, like, you went to school in New York, you live in L.A., like, what are you talking about? Um, how would you as a developer, uh, if you were sitting at home uh, Thanksgiving with me, uh, articulating to my family, what would you say? How would you articulate to, uh, to I would say, these, these all, all of our people who often choose – the source of what's been told to them is where they need to be to actualize themselves, whether that's a job, a city. Um, I think often when they look at individuals who maybe just like choose, who think freely, um, there's a lot of people in the media I won't name who do that. Uh, and then we wake up five years later and we all wearing their clothes <laughs> and things like that, right? Um, how would you articulate the value of what's happening here in the market potential oh it's everything here um you know being from Omaha I'm like I'm from the greatest city on the face of the <laughs> earth right um but there is something about Tulsa it captures you in a way that no other place has ever captured me um and I think that's because the spirit of the people who built this place is in the soil and it's in the air and you can feel that right like People go down to them two little block build, brick, brick buildings on one block and be like, ooh, this is so wonderful. <laughs> and it is because it's in the atmosphere, right? And, and, and that is like 
the people of Greenwood. And and so, you know, we have so many times where people will say, well, it's Black Wall Street, it's Black Wall Street. It is. It's a thing that they did. Um, but you got to understand that Greenwood was a freedom colony. It was formed before Tulsa was a city. Mm-hmm. It was operational as an economic engine for Black autonomy and freedom. So for me, Tulsa is the place where Black people actually own themselves. Mm. And that's why ownership is so important here, um, because it births real freedom for other things to happen. And so I would say, if anyone is looking for um, like the seat of real authentic power, it's Tulsa. Now, you know, Atlanta's great. I've been in Atlanta. I'm like, it's hot. You know, DC was that at one point in time. You know, there are these great cities that make it possible for black people to be free. But this place had the blueprint and was really doing a thing to where the world was coming to it. Yeah. Now it's time to take Tulsa to the rest of the world. Mm. And I think that that's what's happening here in terms of the people that are relocating here, the people that are saying, you know what, this is my city. I'm going to claim my city. And that are standing up to do that. Um, people who see it from afar and just have to come visit. People who go down to that block every day, you know, a thousand yeah. hours in a day. It's the busiest corner. I mean, it's a billion dollar block. I be driving. It really is. I would drive by, and you just you'll just see people wandering, yeah. looking to the deploy their dollars, just... <laughs> and got nothing to do but yeah. get a, a mural. Yeah. Love the mural. Yeah. Love the bricks. <laughs> but we need more. And so yeah. you know, that's our gift is yeah. is the ability to serve this community in a way that gives people more. I love that. Um, wrapping up here, if you had a message for every human. What would that message be? Take up space. Mm. I mean, period. Everything in this life will work to diminish you, to make you put yourself in a box, and to make you identify the things about yourself that are limiting factors. My thing is take up all the space you can in every room that you enter into because that space is lacking you. And if you don't Mm. take up space, it'll stay void, void of creativity, Mm. void of opportunity, void of depth, um, void of all the things that we, uh, not not that I don't love white people. I love white people. Like, don't get me wrong, but I think there's just something unique about us. There's something beautiful and magical about us as black people. Um, And and I hate um, seeing black people contort themselves to fit Mm. in certain situations situations and circumstances and rooms, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, live that way. I don't think it's necessary. Um, and I think that if you have the opportunity, when you arrive in a space, take it all up, take the air out the room. That's Mm. your God given divine right to do so. (sighs) I just got to breathe. French thank you so much for blessing me, uh, for coming into this space and taking up space uh, and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you.